You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 14, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, bias and racism. Our presenter is Dr. Bridget Jones. She's an associate professor and the medical director in the Office of Equity and Diversity at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, good morning, everyone. This is the second hour of COLA um, for August 14, 2020. <clears throat> um, this morning, um, I have the pleasure of having um, Dr. Bridget Jones, um, one of our faculty at Children's Mercy, <clears throat> um, who is um, um, going to talk to us on bias and racism. As you know, this has been a, um, a hot topic recently um, because of everything that's happened in the last few months. <clears throat> and it's important that we um, we um, address these issues and um, um, have some um, uh, background in how to look at these issues moving forward. Um, so I'm very pleased to have Bridget with us today to um, help us do that. So take it away, Bridget. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, so as Paul said, I'm going to talk about bias and racism. Um, in regards to how it impacts us individually and within our society, but also um, within medicine. So let me see if I can forward my slide. There we go. So um, yesterday I sent out to the section um, the implicit association test. If you wanted to take that beforehand, um, we may have time to take it during this presentation. We'll just kind of have to see how things go. Um, but my intent is that if you can take it, and then I'd like us to have a little bit of discussion about um, your results. You don't have to tell us your results, but we'll just kind of discuss um, the results in general. Um, but just to start out, um, the, the presentation today, um, I always kind of preface it with, you know, um, when we're talking about topics like racism um, and implicit and explicit bias, sometimes it can get uncomfortable, but I think you know, getting uncomfortable is going to be the only thing that's going to allow us to progress. If we're comfortable in the state that we're in, we're not going to be pushed to change. So I don't know how many of you um, have done Orange Theory or heard of Orange Theory. Um, Pre-COVID, I used to go to Orange Theory about five days a week, and um, it's a small group exercise program. Um, and the purpose of, of when you're there you are supposed to push your heart rate up to a um, to a um, a maximal level. Um, you're supposed to push your heart rate up to a, a a level that makes you uncomfortable for at least 12 minutes during your workout. And so the the idea is once you get your heart rate into that level for a certain period of time, the next time you can run a little little farther. You can lift a few more weights. Um, and I think about when, we, when we're talking about racism and bias, um, the, the uncomfortableness that we feel is really pushing our minds to think outside of how we normally think. So today, you know, take a deep breath. Um, you're going to be uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable sometimes when I'm talking about these topics or actually uh, many times when I'm talking about these topics because they're not always pleasant to talk about. But these are the things that's going to help us to learn and to grow. So why are we talking about racism, bias, equity, diversity? Um, well, you know, these, these topics um, and these ideas are now part of industry standards. So especially in medicine and medical education, um, there are requirements from LCME, from ACGME in regards to what we're teaching our trainees um, as far as how to um, interact with um, and knowledge about diverse cultures um, and beliefs because we know that that impacts the health care that we're able to provide. And so there are requirements that we have to meet in what we're teaching our, our trainees, but also as faculty members, we should have some knowledge in those areas as well. Um, it's part of standards for our hospital um, in that we're providing quality and equitable care. So diversity, inclusion, and, and 
um, discussing and addressing racism and how it impacts health and how it impacts the care that we're able to provide um, is now standard practice um, in what we should be doing. And that's really evident in the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement on racism that came out um, actually a year ago. So it was published in August of 2019. Um, so this policy statement was put together by a task force on um, discrimination and bias um, by AAP. Um, and the statement is really a, a landmark statement, I would call it, because it um, is one of the first times there's been a very strong de declaration that racism is a social determinant of health. So racism is something that impacts the health of children. And so in that statement, they describe how pediatricians and people that are involved in the health care of children must be prepared to discuss and address racism and how racism exposure um, impacts our families, um, children, and entire community. So this is another document that I sent out yesterday. Um, hopefully you all had a chance to look at that. but. The, the document is excellent, it's educational, but it also um, provides some real-world um, recommendations that hospitals should be thinking about doing, that healthcare um, institutions, as well as individual pediatricians and people that are involved in the care of children, um, things that you can do as, as an individual to address racism. And please feel free to stop me um, if you have any questions. Um, I can't see the little hand raise thing um, the way I have my slides set up. Uh-oh, and I just took myself out of my presentation. And I can't even see it. Ugh. Let's try this again. Okay, now I can see, but I can't see you, so. Um, you'll just have to speak up if you um, have any questions. So first we'll talk about um, implicit bias. So many of you have probably heard of unconscious or implicit bias. There's been a lot of discussion about implicit bias. There's implicit bias trainings that are, that are offered that I believe our fellows have taken um, before. But implicit bias is really um, your unconscious bias. So you know, as part of your flight or fight system, you collect information about certain situations, about certain groups of people, um, and you use that information, you store it, and you use it um, in times where you have to make quick decisions about things. So implicit bias are social stereotypes about certain groups of people um, or individuals that's outside of our conscious awareness. So we don't really even know that we're storing these thoughts and have these thoughts um, about certain people or certain groups of people. And everyone has unconscious bias um, about a variety of social and identity groups. And so if you took the implicit association test, you likely recognize, um, and, and when, you, when you open it up, there's lots of different implicit bias tests that you can take. Um, but if you took the test, um, you likely revealed that you did have some type of a bias in some way. And so it's a natural thing of how we organize our thoughts, um, again, so that we can make um, quick decisions. Um, but the problem with implicit bias is we don't know that we have those bias, biases. We're blinded to them. So unless we do activities to specifically uncover our bias, and work actively to address our biases when they come up, um, they're always going to come into play and they're always going to impact, you know, how we think about patients, how we think about one another, how we think about an applicant to our um, program or an, a job applicant. They're always going to be there in some way. Um, and so you have to actively, continuously try to address those biases. So towards the end of the presentation, um, there's a video clip that gives you three very simple steps of how to, to mitigate biases when you're going into certain situations that you know that biases may come up. So affinity bias is a type of unconscious bias that's very common. Um, so it's very, you know, um, 
common or natural that we favor people who are like us. I mean, that's just human nature. We, you know, are drawn to people that like the same things that we do, that like the same music or um, the, the same hobbies. Um, and we typically draw to people that have similar racial and ethnic and cultural backgrounds as well. And so um, we tend to, to, to favor people that are like us and think less favorably of people that don't share the same backgrounds and ideals. And so this, is, this comes into play many times when you have um, certain groups that are very homogeneous and there are, is no diversity within those groups, um, it's sometimes hard to think outside that group and outside that box. And so, you know, when you're thinking about putting together a selection committee, um, for a, um, a faculty position or a committee to select trainees, making sure that you have diverse perspectives within that group is really important to kind of break up some of that affinity bias So where we naturally are drawn to the people that we want to have a beer with. Um, so you hear that, that, that um, phrase a lot that comes up with um, our presidential elections is that presidents are often judged by um, who's a good candidate, who you want to have a beer with. And that many times does not mean that that's the most qualified candidate. So explicit bias is um, really the opposite. So it's not unconscious at all. So it's a, con a conscious, intentional bias, um, whether it's positive or negative feeling about a certain group um, or a certain identity. Um, they're espoused openly, they're overt, they're deliberate. So one example that I give um, is, you know, boys may make the open, um, explicit bias statement. You know, an eight-year-old boy may just automatically say, well, girls can't run faster than boys. So that's making an explicit um, bias statement about all girls, um, although there are some girls that could run faster than some, some boys. So that's one um, example of how explicit bias um, plays out. And so the harm in unconscious and um, conscious bias or explicit biases are that if they go unchecked, if we um, don't try to counter those or to mitigate those, they become normalized um, within a society or within an organization. And that's when harm occurs, when you're um, generalizing certain people based on um, unconscious or conscious beliefs um, and making judgments about them. So racism is a type of explicit bias. So, um, you know, many times when we talk about racism, it, you think of racism as, um, you know, calling someone a racial slur or refusing to serve a person in a restaurant because they're of a certain race. But racism is really about the structure of value, value of life um, and power. Um, so racism is really when you assign value or you um, divvy up power based on someone's um, assigned race. So it's, it divides power and oppression that structures opportunities and assigns value based on race. And it unfairly disadvantages some people that's, that are assigned a certain racial group versus others um, where it unfairly advantages those people that are assigned a certain racial group. And we can talk about you know, race also, what race actually means. Um, you know, there really is no biological race. The majority of our DNA, 99% of our DNA is the same. And so there's really no biological difference um, based on race. Race is a um, social construct that is made up that has been used to assign people to one group or another. Um, and within the United States, it's been used as a way to um, assign value to life and also to um, to divvy up power and, and resources. And as you can see from the timeline there in your right corner, we're in the very early stages currently of reckoning with the foundations of race and racism um, throughout our history. So, you know, um, much of the legislation, um, Civil Rights Act reconstruction just happened in the last several decades. Um, for example, my parents grew up in 
a um, society where, you know, initially when they were adults, they were not able to vote. Um, so we're really in the early stages of dealing with this foundation of dividing power um, to one group versus another um, based on um, what their skin color is. And so racism, um, there's different types of racism, as I previously mentioned. So, you know, I mentioned um, personal, interpersonal race, racism, which we'll talk about next. But there's also internalized racism. So looking at that timeline of thinking about how racism has been utilized as a foundation within our country, it is, it is very ingrained in our culture. And it's so ingrained that um, even people that are from marginalized groups so, for example, black people hold racist thoughts and ideas. It's, it's hard to escape. And so this is really um, evidenced by the doll test that was done um, back in the 60s, but also was replicated um, during, I believe, the late 80s or 90s, um, that showed how small children um, learn racism at a very young age. So I'm going to, hopefully this, this works, I'm going to show this clip here. Are you still able to see my screen? Um, so maybe I will send these, the links out for you to watch them later because I do think, um, you know, they are um, really powerful um, videos that basically show that, you know, at a very young age, um, children, um, African-American children are taught racist um, or learn racist ideas and thoughts um, about themselves. Um, and so to think about as adults how we, you know, may think that we don't hold racist thoughts or ideas, but when you see that children hold them at such a very young age, um, it's clear that, that, you know, we have them too. So are you able to see my slides now? Are you seeing those? Yes, we okay. can see those. Okay. All right. So interpersonal racism. Um, is, um, you know, like I mentioned before, so that's person-to-person -person racism. So, you know, that's kind of what you typically think about where there's racial slurs or hate crimes um, or microaggressions. Um, does anyone know what a microaggression is? So microaggressions are um, aggressions that happen frequently um, that may seem subtle um, that are things like, you know, commenting on um, how well a person speaks um, if they're of a certain racial or eth ethnic group. Or it may be things like, um, you know, if, if you're in introducing a group of professionals and you call everyone in the group by their professional title, but the woman or the person of color you refer to as their, their first name. So those are microaggressions and they happen frequently and they may seem subtle, but they have a really significant impact. And can everyone, can someone mute? There's a lot of movement in the background from someone. Okay. Um, so this is um, a, a caveat that was published by an article written by medical students um, that talked about, that describes um, some types of bias that we see in the, in the medical um, environment. So. Um, they say homeless people are only looking for a handout and not interested in bettering themselves. The circumstances of why someone ends up homeless or uninsured have an endless range. Oftentimes it involves quite a bad hand dealt in a tragic story. However, the easier thing to do rather than wrestle with any of the sobering details with the patients is to chalk up their predicament as they brought it on themselves. They deserve to be homeless. Working through my month in the emergency room, there were certain patients that were considered frequent flyers, and that reputation certainly had a negative connotation. Physicians viewed these patients as a nuisance who just wanted a roof over their head for the night and, worst of all, weren't even willing to pay money. The flippant attitude towards the indigent in an uninsured community may create an atmosphere where only a surface level of medical treatment is given those to those who have deep and chronic um, Let's see, I lost the slide again. But, um, you know, I think that really highlights, um, that really highlights how sometimes our implicit and our explicit biases play out um, 
in the medical field. So, you know, you could exchange this caveat or this scenario from a homeless person to sometimes some of the language that we use um, when some of our sickle cell patients come into the emergency room, um, where they're often perceived as drug seeking or malingering um, about their pain. And so how can we counter those thoughts when they occur? So institutional bias, um, it occurs, um, you know, as it states within in institutions, and it's when it, it, institutional bias or racism occurs from a practice or a policy standpoint. So when you have policies or practices in place that um, divvy up or divide power or opportunities or value based on a per per person's racial Group. So it's regardless of socioeconomic status, it's regardless of social standing, it's solely based on their, their, racial, um, on their racial group. And so when we start getting into institutional bias or systemic um, racism, this is when you have large impacts on communities and, and really our, our entire community um, as a whole. So one example of institutional racism um, is, you know, how we treat certain immigrants that come to this country. Um, so there are some immigrants that are that come to the, this country that, um, you know, have very significant hardships with with trying to immigrate, even when fleeing for, from very dangerous um, environments. And other immigrants, um, we we they follow a different policy and procedure. Um, avenue um, to become citizens or become um, immigrants here. So that's how an institutional, from a policy level, how you divide up value of life and um, power and opportunity um, really solely based on race. And then so structural racism um, involves when you put all of those institutions together that um, have policies that assign value and opportunity and power by race, then that leads to structural um, significant impacts that become historically rooted um, within certain communities and certain um, groups. So you have, um, you know, if you put together inequitable schooling, inequitable access to health care, inequitable um, um, law enforcement practices, um, and those are experienced widely by a large group of people based on their race, then that has long-standing impacts for centuries. Um, and so those are things that cannot, a person cannot um, overcome just by, you know, having more money or having a better education. Um, they may, because of those privileges, they may not experience some of the, the, the impacts of racism as severely, but they still are certainly impacted by it. And so this is a great example of how um, structural racism works and uh, one that's close to home here in Kansas City. So does anyone know what this map here is on the right hand side? That is redlining. Yes. So um, do you like to explain what redlining is or do you want me to explain? I am happy to take a stab at it. So back when um, people were essentially um, giving out mortgages for homes, um, there were these, uh, as Dr. Jones has shown on these maps here, there were these red lines created in districts that essentially restricted the ability to apply and receive a loan um, to the African-American or the black community. So they were essentially not able to even get loans to have housing in these specific district. Um, redlining is now illegal in the United States. However, as this map is shown, the long-term effects of redlining are still very prominent and prevalent um, in our society. Yeah. Thank you. That's perfect explanation. So, um, and as Dr. Pandalia mentioned, um, so banks would actually take maps and circle a red line around certain areas, particularly areas that were predominantly black, and would not provide mortgages um, or or home loans to those to to black people in those communities. And so, you know, black people could not own homes, um, and so that impacted their ability to 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 
have ownership and develop wealth and be able to pass it on to generations. But that also led to disinvestment in those areas. So this is Kansas City um, here. Um, and for some of you who don't know, redlining was actually invented um, in, in Kansas City um, by the, the person who we just took the, their name off of the fountain on the plaza. Um, he developed the practice of redlining and, and disseminated that practice all over the country. Um, but um, so the, the disinvestment in those areas led to having run down neighborhoods, lack of access to, to development. So that's why we don't have any grocery stores, hardly the east side of Truce. We have very little health care access. We have very few parks and open green space. There's a large major highway that was built right next to those areas. So that's what redlining leads to. And so that you can see these redlined areas overlaid with the dots on the map here in the same areas in, in Kansas City. And so these dots are actually our asthma data that show children that live in these areas who have had more than four um, emergency room visits or hospitalizations for asthma. So you can see how directly how redlined areas have led to a major health impact in these children. Um, I worked with a medical student earlier this summer and we did the same thing and plotted out where the COVID cases um, were showing up, especially early on when we were seeing that the COVID cases were concentrated in many of the, the predominantly black um, neighborhoods. And again, that directly overlays with the red line um, area. So that, that, this is a demonstration of how institutionally, um, you know, um, policies and procedures can impact entire communities. So, okay, the implicit association test, let's see how we're doing on time. I think we have um, time for you to um, take out your phones and um, complete the implicit association test. It probably takes you about five to seven minutes if you already have it pulled up. Okay, I think we'll move on. Um, did, was anyone able to finish or um, of you who completed it yesterday. Um, do you have any thoughts or um, just initial thoughts about the test or your results at all that you'd like to share or be willing to share? So a lot of times um, when I've done this, I've done this presentation with our residents um, um, previously and, and other um, trainee groups. And so I think many times people are, are shocked by the, the test results. Um, it, especially if it's the first time that, that you've done the test. And in most rooms, um, people question the validity, validity of the test. Um, so if you go to the Implicit Bias website on Harvard, um, they talk about the validation process. And um, I think the last time I checked on the website, about 10 million people had, had done the test. And I've done it several times, and I typically get the same result um, each time. And so you know, I, I do think it's a it's a valid test, um, but it's just one tool, you know, that that is useful in trying to uncover some of those those blind spots um, that we may have. So, um, as I mentioned before, un unconscious bias is common. Um, so, on the the Harvard website for implicit association, um, they state that the majority of people that that take this this test do have um, bias. Um, and as you can see, there's different types of implicit association tests, but for the test um, that assesses bias um, against black people and preference for white people, um, the majority of the people that take this test show some level of implicit bias um, towards um, people that are classified as white versus people that are classified um, as black. So overall, um, you know, there's a, there's a pro-white bias within um, our society. And so I think, you know, one step to addressing our biases, whether they're unconscious or not, is um, recognizing that we do hold these biases. Um, on, the assess on the Implicit Association website, there's tests you can take for gender, for weight, for ability status. So I think they're really enlightening just to kind of take them and, and kind of see um, where you're at. 
anyone willing to provide any comment or um, about their test results or questions? I just thought it felt so uh, uh, so odd to try to associate like skin color with the word good or bad and like good or bad things and so it felt just sort of sort of wrong and unnatural to associate like such uh, uh, just like b like very polarizing terms with the color of skin yeah and so I, I think what the implicit bias test or association test gets at is kind of what our brain does unconsciously sometimes, especially in certain um, situations. So if we're in a high stress, um, you know, a, a, a situation where, you know, we're, we're having to move fast and think fast, then we probably do rely on just very simple dichotomies of good, bad, you know, is this, is this safe or unsafe? Um, and so that's really what it, it's designed to uncover, how we just make these very general um, judgments. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay, so I think we'll move on here. So, um, yeah, so that was a perfect segue into the next um, slide of when these biases come into play. So they come into play when you're under time pressure, when the answer's not clear, you kind of got to make a judgment call, when there's high emotion, um, when there's um, high cognitive load, you're having to take in a lot of information, and um, likely many other um, situations. And so if you think about these, these, these situations, I mean, this describes our medical environment a lot of times. We're pressed for time, we have to make these kind of judgment calls about um, our medical diagnosis or a family that may be ambiguous. There's sometimes high emotion. We're incorporating a lot of information. And that's, I think, what's really hard within medicine in making sure that we're countering our biases when we um, fall back on them. Um, groups can have collective or unconscious bias. So I think I mentioned that before in kind of the affinity um, bias. but. You know, again, I think in medicine, many times we're, we're very, um, we like to kind of be in our, our own groups and do things our own way. Um, and so when we're not able to invite and incorporate other ideas, then we're relying on the unconscious biases of, of the group. Um, you know, I think one thing when thinking about, you know, how we think about applicants when they come in for our fellowship program or an applicant for a job, um, I hear this term made all the time of whether or not someone is a good fit. And I think that is a, um, is, is a way that we often rely on our, our biases of whether they fit within our current group um, that we have or not and, and kind of make that dichotomy of if they don't fit and kind of have the same, you know, interest and um, kind of background, then they may not be a good fit for our group. And so on the converse, we should try to counter that and say, you know, what could this person bring to our group that, that we're lacking in and what um, different perspective could they bring that would be helpful for our um, program or helpful for our patients um, or our community. So the good fit um, um, tag is, is definitely, you know, for me when I hear that, um, you know, I know that the group is relying on this, this group bias. So, you know, as physicians, I think, especially as, as pediatricians, um, I admit I'm biased as a pediatrician. I think pediatricians are, are great people and wonderful people. We take care of kids. and um, But, you know, we're not immune to bias and how it impacts our um, patient care. Um, even though we are, you know, altruistic people that do great things and take care of kids. So this is a study. Um, that was done by um, Dr. Tiffany Johnson, um, where she looked at um, bias among um, towards adults and children um, based on race um, among trainees. So these were pediatric resident um, trainees. And what she found was that there was significant um, racial bias um, or pro-white bias um, towards patients that were white, including pediatric patients, including children, 
um, among the residents that, that um, completed the implicit association um, assessment. So, you know, we hold these biases not just for our for adults, but also we apply these biases to children. So it certainly applies um, in in the work that we do. Um, and it, it plays out in, you know, how we deliver care. So this is a study that showed that um, they were comparing the ability of this um, kind of algorithm to determine or predict whether a patient had sepsis or not versus kind of the clinician's um, judgment. And so what they found was that with the algorithm, kind of an automated process of assessing sepsis, um, there was no racial bias that was, in, that was um, or, or there was not as much racial bias, there still was, but, um, but the algorithm was able to take out some of the bias where when there was clinicians that identified whether a patient had sepsis or not, then um, black patients were less likely to receive a diagnosis of sepsis, even when they did have ses sepsis or met the algorithm's criteria um, for sepsis. And so this shows how it could directly play out in a medical environment where, again, we think that we are treating all patients the same, and that is our goal, but if we're not countering these, these biases that we hold about certain groups or certain patients, um, then it's, it's going to come out. Um, again, in the medical environment, um, it may, you know, these biases may determine who gets certain procedures or who gets access to certain um, diagnostic test. So this was a study that showed that in children that were presenting to the ED for a headache, um, one of the factors that predicted whether or not you were more likely to get neuroimaging or not was if you were a, um, a white child. Um, so again, race determined who had access to a medical um, intervention or a diagnostic um, test. Um, so just kind of reinforcing that, you know, we, it, it's there and it impacts the, the work that we do. So these are some of the, you know, unintended consequences of implicit and explicit um, bias. We've talked about kind of how it impacts our clinical work. Um, but if you think about, you know, how we divvy up opportunities within um, medical organizations or national societies, so affects you know, who's on committees, who's on boards, who's in leadership positions, making policy decisions. Within the grant review process, there's documented um, and published um, um, studies that show that um, um, those that are from underrepresented um, racial and ethnic groups um, have decreased scores on their grants. And even what you're stud studying also, there's a bias there. So people that um, conduct studies that focus on kind of social determinants of health or equity and, and race equity, um, those are typically scored lower. Um, it impacts, as we talked about, how screening and hiring is done, evaluations of trainees, um, your organizational climate and dynamics, um, who's promoted. Um, so I'm on promotions committees and a lot of times those discussions are really subjective of who we think meets criteria um, or not. And even you know, in thinking about who has had the opportunity to um, do the scholarly work to meet promotion criteria, there's bias that plays in, into that. Um, within curriculums, there's bias in the peer review. So broadly, um, you know, it, it's, it's there in all of the work that we do. So I think we're kind of running out of time, but I just want to show, um, try to show these slides quickly. So for those of you who may be familiar with Robin D'Angelo, she is an author who wrote White Fragility, and she talks about how we try to cover up the fact that we have these biases and not see it. So we try to say these things about ourselves to tell ourselves that we don't have these, these biases. So, you know, I grew up poor, so I can't be biased because, you know, I, I grew up in an environment where I was underprivileged or, you know, I do mission work or I donate to certain certain groups so I can't be biased or I can't be racist. So those are those things don't don't mitigate the bias. Um, and this was an activity that I thought we could go through, but we won't have time. But I'm going to send these questions out to you um, 
because I was in a workshop that Robin DeAngelo did when she came to UMKC this past fall. And what she did was divided us into groups. Um, and we asked um, ourselves or, or we answered these questions within the group. Um, and really it uncovered kind of how segregated our lives are um, and how, you know, you can't help but to have these blind spots because there's little exposure to people that are outside of your, your you know, your kind of same racial group or background. Um, and it was really evident for the, the white people that were in my group. And I think this was the first time they had thought about that they, you know, had grown up in neighborhoods that were all white. They did not, did not have any black people in their neighborhood. They never had a black teacher. Um, they really didn't have anyone in their in their life that was um, non-white that had you know they'd have a significant relationship um, with and so that's a way of kind of thinking about you know how can I not have these biases if I'm not exposed to other people and these were some other questions they asked about you know major life events you know if you've attended a wedding or a funeral um, you know who was who were was at those those events, and so um, Ibram Kendi um, is the the best selling book. Um, it's probably been um, the top New York Times seller for the past three months or so at least. Um, but even previously was a very popular book, How to Be a Rant Anti Racist, and he talks about the fact that it's not it's not just not being a racist. Because, you know, we talked about how racism is foundational within our culture and it's kind of raining down on our heads all of the time. And we think we have this umbrella because we're good people, but that umbrella has holes in it. Um, and so it's, it's not just not being a racist. We have to work to be an anti-racist. And being an anti-racist is not, uh, you know, an adjective that describes someone. It's, it's a practice. It's something that we have to work towards and counter um, every day. And this includes all people, um, you know, because as I mentioned before, even people that are from um, um, racial groups, um, underrepresented ra racial groups, um, we also have racist ideals and thoughts that we have to counter. And this is part of the reason you know, um, in our society, there are, are racist stereotypes that are um, raining down on us constantly that we don't even see sometimes. So, you know, from an ad that shows, you know, a black person is being dirty and then once you use the Dove soap, you're white and you're clean, um, to how people are presented in the media. Um, or news reporting. So this, this is very interesting. I think this was in Iowa where this is the exact same day there was a group of men that were arrested for the same thing for burglary charges. And you can see how the black men are presented with their mugshot and the white men are presented as college wrestlers and with their suit and tie. Um, so these are, are, are stereotypes and, um, you know, racist um, um, divisions that are, are kind of we experience all the time and don't even recognize it. This is from the University of Missouri. Um, this was um, put out a few, um, a, I think it was last year, which is really interesting after they kind of went through a lot of turmoil and um, had a lot of um, anti-racism training, but they put out this ad um, for University of Missouri. And you can see, you know, for um, the African-American woman, she's, She's, you know, I'm an African-American woman and that's it. For the, the white woman, she's a future doctor and kind of the same thing from the, the athlete. So they, it was up for about a day or so and then they, they took this ad down. Um, so this is another video that I don't think will probably work, but hopefully you can scan the QR code um, and um, take a look at it um, or just have it as a reference. So this um, video shows, um, his name is Quinn Capers, he is Associate Dean for Faculty Development at Ohio State, and he um, has a very quick YouTube video, it's like three minutes, it goes through three ways to mitigate bias. So, you know, finding a common identity with someone is one way to counter bias, um, thinking the opposite. Um, and then there's one other thing, I can't remember. Um, but this is a good video just to kind of have as a, as a stash, you know, for, for example, during um, our fellowship 
recruitment season, you know, this is something that interviewers could look at really quickly before they do their interviews or before they do their evaluations to think about how they can actively counter bias um, during that process. These are some other resources that I would recommend um, if you haven't already read some of these. So How to Be an Anti-Racist, as I mentioned, is, is really an excellent book. It's actually just very instructional. That's the, the thing that I, that I love about it. Um, White Fragility from Robin D'Angelo, where some of those questions came from um, that I'll send out. Um, the Warmth of Other Suns and Cast, which was just um, released this past week, is by Isabella Wilkerson. Um, so in Warmth of Other Suns, she tells the story of the great migration of um, African American or black people from the South into the North. And, um, you know, they thought they were escaping Jim Crow and the severity of Jim Crow, but still had a really difficult time with racism and segregation within the North and other places that they um, went to. Cass um, describes race as America as a, as a rigid caste system. Um, so I just started reading this book, but it's, it's really good um, so far. Thick is by Tracy McMillan, who's a um, sociologist um, who writes about um, the intersectionality of um, race and gender. So she's an African-American woman. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, this book is excellent. It talks about, it. it's actually a letter that he writes to his um, son about being a black man in America. Um, so it's an excellent book. And then Medical Apartheid really kind of gives the history of um, how racism and things like medical experimentation and eugenics has impacted um, how we practice medicine um, today. Um, if you're on social media, these, there's some great people to follow. So Clint Cappers, who I mentioned, did, did the video. He's great on Twitter. Rhea Boyd, um, Uche Blackstock, Sacha Rita Bowers, and Howard Liu. Um, so they're always posting great information and passing around articles. So these are, if you're on social media, some people that I would suggest following. Um, and then um, finally, I, I love this quote. Um, from Esther Chu. So she's another person that's really active on Twitter, but um, does a lot of equity work. She helped to start the um, Times Up Healthcare organization that Jules Mercy is a signatory for um, that addresses discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and so she says that by staying comfortable, leaving one topic or another out of the discussion and softening culpability keeps us from conflict in the short term and ensures that nothing substantially improves over the long term. Instead, what health professionals need to do is critically assess where and how we can change course. And again, you know, it goes back to my first slide, you know, we, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable um, and have these conversations. And there may be times that you may say things or think you said something that, you know, was, was was offensive to someone or, you know, in having these conversations, something that didn't come out right, but you're, it's, it's hard to learn and grow when you're not willing to even um, say certain things or recognize certain things. Um, this is um, just a spectrum I wanted to share and thinking about, you know, our organization or our culture of kind of where we may fall on the um, racist versus anti-racist um, spectrum. So again, this is something else I can I can send out. I think it's just really interesting to to look at this and just kind of you know poll and see where you think we lie and where we need to improve. So with that, um, thank you. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, I did want to highlight an upcoming section um, for Office of Equity and Diversity. Um, there will be a bystander training. So you know we, we mentioned microaggressions, and so if you know, the workplace, sometimes you may witness someone um, um, being a victim of a microaggression. And so what could you do in that, in that moment as a bystander to not just stand there and let it happen, but to, to intervene and to help that person? So that's what this session will be about. Okay, so with that, if there's any questions. Thank you, Bridget. That was excellent. Um, I, I don't really have a question, I have a comment. I do appreciate your, you talking about, um, you know, about uh, people looking at the um, applicants and um, people for the fit that they may have for an institution. And I can see some of that part may be related to, people may say related to like personality types or, or like <clears throat> um, research interests or something. But again, when you think about it in the, the whole 
um, you know, the whole realm of all that, what that means, um, there is, um, you know, um, bias that comes into that. And I think that's something, as you said, when we start doing interviews here in a few weeks, that we need to be looking at, like, what can that person bring to our group and what, you know, um, um, things that we should be looking at instead. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Yeah, no problem. I mean, that's what we've encouraged within the residency program is, you know, discussing diversity um, within the selection process and thinking about for every applicant, you know, talk about what do they bring to our program that may be unique, um, that would be beneficial for us and um, our patients in our community. So I will send out those the slides to everyone, um, and so you'll have those links. Um, you can access that video if you if you like. Okay, great. Thanks again, Bridget. Have a great weekend. Okay, bye. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. It was great. All right, thanks. All right, bye. 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 Thanks, Bridget. All right.